mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with a hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. we call upon you today, just as David did, to forgive us, to restore us, to renew us, to use us as instruments of grace in today's world. Lord, you are our God and our King. You are sovereign. Your providence speaks and is constantly working. And Lord, we give you praise and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you. Before you're seated, let the people around you know that you really like them. Well, great to have you all here today. If you're watching via live stream, hi. We're glad that you have found time to join us in whatever country you call home. We do want to say welcome to those of you who are here today. Um, several in our church family are not in our sanctuary, but we uh, know that the summer months bring a lot of travel, and we are grateful that people can have that family time um, throughout the summer times here in America. Hey, we do want to welcome the English family Hey, they're doing some church planning in Charleston, South Carolina. And I know that picture's kind of um, small, but uh, that is uh, the English family along with uh, Daisy and myself. We uh, took them up to Niagara Falls and we spent a little time with them there. Then we came back and then they stayed up there until 1030 
that night to see the lights on the falls and uh, see the fireworks that uh, goes on every night up there. They just had a great time. They'd never seen Niagara Falls before, and they are impressed with the beauty of Western New York State. So we were so happy that they're um, here today. They're staying in our mission house uh, right next door, and we are so grateful that that uh, facility is there and uh, completed. So we want to just say hi, welcome to Tyler and Sheena. And the oldest daughter is Skylar, and the youngest daughter is Evelyn. And uh, we're so happy that you all are here. Um, Sheena is the daughter, fourth child, uh, of Sam George and Elizabeth in India. So she was here years and years ago um, to um, actually uh, give us a, a great um, idea of what's going on in India when her father was here. And some of you might remember she did an interpretive worship dance for us, and it was just, just so beautiful. Um, today they are church planners in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. I talked to Tyler about his um, vision for that area. Uh, they were able to sell their house in North Carolina where they were serving um, at the Summit Church. And they uh, bought a home in Charleston. And it's in an area where they're going to be doing several phases of construction. Uh, of construction. So a lot of uh, homes uh, are going to be going up over the next several years. And you're in the first phase, second. second phase of building. So they're anticipating a lot of people coming into that area. And uh, they're already looking at that as a great mission field. And uh, they have supervision. You know we're all about church planning. Uh, that's what we have been promoting throughout our 35 years of existence. And we're so happy that... Um, Tyler and Sheena have answered the call of God to do that. Tyler is the discipleship pastor, so he is going to be involved a lot with evangelism and discipleship, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, small groups, as well as overseeing a lot of that discipleship programming in the local church. So uh, we just want um, you all to know, y'all, y'all to know, <laughs> up here we say you guys, um, <clears throat> we want you to know that we really do uh, appreciate what you're doing, and you are on our prayer update that goes out once or twice every month, and uh, you are being prayed for by this church family. Daisy um, has a gift, I believe. I oh, you already gave to them? Wow. <laughs> Thank you. That was nice. So thank you for what you're doing. We really do appreciate the fact that you've chosen to be with us today. If you wouldn't mind right now, uh, we want to pray over you. And I'm just going to ask Ralph, Bob, um, Heidi, I know you're not feeling great, but if you wouldn't mind uh, just going behind them, putting your hands on them, and we are going to be uh, praying for them. I'm going to ask Tom Marino to come and just, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, praying for God's presence, God's power as uh, this young family serves the Lord in S Charleston, South Carolina, right here in the United States. And uh, we just want the church to grow. Uh, it is about 150 people now, uh, and we are just excited to see where God is going to take them. Tom, thanks. Dear Father, we thank you for the English family. And Father, we just pray that as they start this ministry and they continue on in this ministry, Father, that you would absolutely cover them, Father, with protection. And Father, pray that souls would be one, one to the Lord, Father, in all their efforts, all their uh, hard work, Father. I just pray that it would just all come to the glorification, Father, of you and your son, Jesus. And just, Father, I just pray for protection. I pray for uh, their finances, Father, total blessing, total protection, and uh, that the enemy, enemy would not prevail, Father, against uh, their ministry and their outreach, Father. 
We thank you, Father, for them. We just pray you continue to, to bless them in their lives through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks so much. Uh, Daisy and I are going to be leaving on Thursday to go to Utah, the state of Utah. We'll be going to Salt Lake City, and we will be uh, there for four days at a Wycliffe Bible Translators uh, uh, Summit, and we will be bringing a report back to you on that. So because uh, we will be gone, Noah Sheehan will be speaking next Sunday, and it's going to be a great opportunity for us as a church family to be praying over Noah as well. Next month, he'll be leaving for a six-week training. He'll be spending three weeks in Mozambique and then three weeks in Zambia. And we are so thankful for this young man as he continues to follow the Lord in his life. So please be praying for Daisy and I as we travel right here in the U.S. and also for Noah as he'll be preparing uh, throughout this week. Also, I would also like to ask you to pray for uh, my visa to Nigeria. Um, I was able to go to New York City and uh, submit the paperwork necessary and do all the biometrics that is necessary as well. And we're hoping before we go to Utah that I will have received that visa. We're asking the Lord to open doors that no one can shut or close doors that no one can open. We want his will to be done. I want to look at two words here, the new covenant that are in these verses here in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. And uh, I found this tremendous um, sentence by a teacher that I'd like to share. The new covenant made by God with his people was made official at the cross of Christ. It secures the gift of the spirit. It transforms hearts and brings to completion God's plan to redeem man. I thought that kind kind of covered everything there that and that it's so important to understand that what God's doing, the new covenant comes out of what has happened before. And we are the ones who have received the new covenant as well. If you're if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, the new covenant applies to you as well. Uh, Paul, who had a an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus who was a man who breathed threats and murder and hated Christians and hated what Jesus stood for and everything that was happening. When he met Christ, he was changed. And he says this in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And he is he's picking up on this transformation that happens because of the relationship with with Jesus through the new covenant. Now, now Paul, in his travels, went to a place called Corinth. And at that time, he went there, he preached, he left, and he wrote a letter back to them, 1 Corinthians. And he, he picks up on the being focused. And, you know, this world is sometimes so hard to stay focused on things because there's so much noise of things going on. And as believers, we have to keep focused. And here's what Paul said because of the fact that there was so much going on there and, uh, and that he'd preached the word and that people were now adding things to it, changing it. And here's what he said. And I, brethren, so people who are believers he's speaking to, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you a testimony of God. That's what they were looking for, the outward, outward things. He's going for the heart. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 
those sentences show he's in difficulty. He is keeping the main thing, Christ, preaching him and him crucified. He's keeping the main thing, the main thing. And that is an incredible way to focus in these days when things are so disturbing uh, to us in so many ways that keep the main thing the main thing. So when we look at the, our verses and we say them together twice through, um, we think of the new covenant and how God was doing in the time of Jeremiah, hundreds of years later, to send his sin, son who lived a sinless life died on the cross, raised from the dead, and is in heaven at the right hand of the Father now, that that covenant was for the Jews, Israel and Judah, as it says in the verses, but also then, through the preaching of the word, came to Gentiles, which is us, right? So we have this tremendous benefit, and God's word is just so wonderful and powerful not to miss that the Spirit is active and working in people every single day. And we just thank him for that. So let's say these together. Uh, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. I will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. Uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that you will want to be our God. And we... We're saying if we have a relationship with your son, that you, we are your people, God. We thank you that your ways are not our ways. We thank you that your thoughts are not our thoughts. And your thoughts were to think of people, how you loved, how you sent your one and only son. We just thank you, God. There's not enough words we can say. Uh, and not enough actions, but, but you call us to be obedient and through our words and through our actions to show what we believe, Lord, and who we believe in and why. So let's keep the main thing the main thing, God, just like Paul has shown to preach you and preach you crucified, Lord, that more people will hear the word. Just as we talked before uh, church this morning about how one person influences another and influences another and influences another, and a lot of times we don't even know the people who have been praying for us to become believers, Lord. We pray for those people that we, don't, we know that are not believers. Maybe we know them personally. We don't know them personally, God. As you put people on our hearts, that we take that time to stop during the day and pray for them and to pray for your will to be done in their lives, Lord. We know it is your, your will that all men come to you. We know, Lord, though that some may not. We, we pray for them too. We pray that their hearts would not become hard towards you. We pray that, uh, that just the, the gloriousness that you are, Lord, would be shown in our lives and we would be salt and light in this time. In your precious name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Would you please stand and worship with us? Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from always oh, is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow. song cause you are good you're good oh you are good you're good oh you are good you're good oh you are good you're good oh
16 13 says commit your work to the lord and your plans will be established for this next song i pray that this would just be your prayer to invite the holy spirit to work within you
It's your breath in our life. 
thank you, Father God, for this time this morning that we can worship together. Thank you for the voices, Father, for the hearts that are pure and driven for you, Father. Lord, we just ask this morning, as Pastor Dave comes to preach, Lord, we know that we are going to hear biblical teaching. We praise you for that, Father. Lord, we just ask that you cover him. Lord, prepare our hearts as we continue this time in worship. Father, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for three weeks, we've been looking at Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6 as kind of our starting point. And uh, this Sunday is going to be the last message as we uh, have investigated and, and tried to understand more about what these two verses are saying to us. We've used other passages of Scripture and we've highlighted some individuals. We'll review those very quickly. But it's important for us to understand that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 really, if lived out, if we truly followed what those two verses teach, would give us so much peace and freedom in our Christian walk. Let's say these verses together this morning. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to once again look at your word. Lord, I pray that we would truly get it, that we would live out the truth of these two verses. Lord, we thank you for your work in our lives. We thank you for the way that you continually show us how we need to be followers of Christ in every area of our life. And it all starts with seeking you with all of our heart. So, Lord, I pray that truly we would get it. In Christ's name, amen. You know, as we look at verse 5, and if you wouldn't mind putting that back up there, Holly, we see in the last line, and lean not on your own understanding. I, I love the fact that God has put that in there for us because it is, is such a contrast with the first line and then with the third and fourth lines in verse 6. Lean not on your own understanding. You know, we as individuals know that when we lean on our own understanding, we truly become an authority on what we're going to think and what we're going to say and what we're going to do. When that becomes our priority, our own understanding, it will impact everything we think, say, and do. And most likely, it's going to lead us into having a diminished opportunity for peace and effectiveness. It amazes me how 10 people can see one event and we can have 10 different, not only summaries, but we can have 10 different conclusions as to what was seen means. We all have our own filters. We are gravitating toward people that we believe come in line with our views. Uh, we are looking at times for people that will agree with us and, and embolden our view, help us to stand better. Uh, we know that sometimes when we are trying to figure things out, we fill in the blanks. Have you ever filled in the blanks before? I did that again this week. I get hundreds of text messages and videos and photos and all of that every single week. And sometimes I have to go through them very quickly. And I received a text me message from an individual that I've known for many years 
but who has just started to learn texting. And his texting was using abbreviations and all of this stuff that I wasn't familiar with, not, not just familiar because I'm not in that, that realm, but I, I'm not familiar of that kind of, of symbolism from him because he's always straightforward, always straightforward. So as I read this text message from him, I interpreted it completely different from what it was really saying to me. And for three days, I filled in the blank with my own understanding. Needless to say, I didn't give a positive view of this text. And there was nothing wrong with the text. It's just because it was so precise and so short and he used abbreviations and I thought, wow, is he upset with me? Well, he finally called me. And because I had filled in the blank, I determined that his phone call was going to be negative. So I became a little bit defensive as the conversation is starting. I'm so glad I have a wife next to me that put her hand on my lap. And I knew immediately, calm down. <laughs> Not that I was over the top, but she understood that my interpretation was bringing in a negative. As soon as I began to show that negative, he became so concerned and compassionate toward me and immediately said, that is not what I meant at all. I've just started texting and I'm not getting the hang of it. But I said, no, it's not the text. It's the fact that I leaned on my own understanding. That's what I told him. And I said, I am so sorry that I spent three days filling in the blank and I was leaning on what my interpretation was. Boy, it teaches us when we go through these experiences in life. That's what we do so often as we are living our life and walking the journey of faith. We're going right along and we're doing what we believe is right, trusting in the Lord with all of our heart. And we are acknowledging him in all of our ways. And we're confident that he's directing our path. But then all of a sudden, and if you can put verse three up there, or verse five up there again, we lean on our own understanding. God told us very clearly, don't do that. Because the moment that you and I start leaning on our own understanding, we've taken over. And we're acting as though we now are the authority of what is going on around us. We're interpreting it. We're reacting to what we interpret. And we sometimes are putting ourselves in a position where bitterness, doubt, fear, discouragement takes over. And when that happens, we no longer are trusting in the Lord with all of our heart. Because our understanding has been elevated over that trust. It's elevated over acknowledging the Lord in all of our ways. It's so important that we get this. You and I are called in every area of our life to trust in God with all of our heart. Not part of it. And not just sometimes. You see, if I would, was talking with someone else that day, I would have been in the realm where I'm trusting in the Lord with all of my heart and I want to share um, the truth with them as God's word presents it. But in this one area of my personal life, I was allowing my own understanding to be the authority. When we do that, we're in trouble. Because it opens up the door for us 
to stumble. We looked at the Sermon on the Mount, and if you remember, I told you that three months ago, and now it's been four months ago, that, that I wanted just to come in and read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' words, and not comment on it, and not do anything but just read his sermon. And as I was thinking about doing that, as I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that stirring in my heart, I kept saying it won't work. It's just not going to work. People are not going to like that uh, whole uh, process. And they're going to wonder why I didn't do more preparation. So my own understanding was kicking up against that stirring that I believed was there and that I needed to just speak, read the Sermon on the Mount. Well, I finally said, Lord, I surrender, and I'm going to do it. And I did. It was amazing to me that day and also the following week how many people called me or spoke to me as they saw me out and about and said the Lord spoke to them in such a powerful way in one specific area. And it was different for every person that I was talking to. One individual came to me and had tears running down their face and said, that one verse that you read today was used by the Holy Spirit to convict me. And when I leave here, I've got to go talk to somebody right now that I know has something against me. I've got to get it right. There's no preaching humanly present, but yet the word of God, as Jesus preached it, has such power and impact. It's important for us to do things that we're not comfortable with, especially if we know the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, is leading us to do. If we lean on our own understanding, we will miss blessing, and others can miss blessing around us, simply because we're taking the lead instead of giving it to God. Do you understand what I'm saying today? This is so simple and profound, and yet we make it into something it was never intended to be. We give authority to ourself, and we attempt to take it from God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Boy, that's quite straightforward and it's simple. We looked at Stephen. Uh, Stephen was a, a man in the early church that was asked to serve. He was asked to help with a problem and he stepped forward along with six other guys and the problem was alleviated. He wasn't a teacher, he wasn't a preacher, he wasn't an apostle, but yet he was a witness for Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God uh, just flowed through him, and he was able to do a lot of things in, in front of people that gave uh, confirmation to his message of salvation that he was preaching about or speaking about Jesus Christ as he's witnessing. People would look at him and wonder about him. They could try to uh, use their own understanding and in explaining him, and that's exactly what the Pharisees and Sadducees did. You know, the council called him, and, and they brought false witnesses against him. But then Stephen was able to give that message, and it was a powerful message. And as he ended the message, he let the Pharisees know that their problem was that they were stiff-necked and they were unyielding in the heart. In other words, the Pharisees who claimed to know all about the word of God were leaning on their own understanding. And they became the authority. And because of that, Stephen was martyred. But, as it was, as he was being stoned to death, they laid their cloaks at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And then we looked at Saul. Saul was the persecutor of the church. And he was going out and pulling people in, into prison. And he 
was responsible, as he said, of the death of so many Christians. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had great understanding, but it was his understanding. It wasn't God's. He could probably quote this verse. And he probably did. But he was going to that second line and taking ownership of what he was seeing happen with all of these Christians that were talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And his own understanding said, we can't allow this to happen anymore. You know the story. And he became a passionate force against the early church. But what happened? Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and Jesus spoke to him personally. And Jesus let him know that the very thing that he was attempting to do went against trusting in the Lord with all of your heart and acknowledging him in all of his ways. And Paul flipped. Instead of leaning on his own understanding, he relinquished it. And he started trusting God with all of his heart, acknowledging him wherever he would go. And it led him even to the great auditorium where King Agrippa and all of the people around him were standing. And Paul in change was able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Powerful. When we trust in the Lord with all of our heart, and when we acknowledge him in all of our ways, he is going to bring success to our path. He is going to direct our steps. It is going to happen. That's the truth. And when that happens, there's peace. There's victory. There's effectiveness. There's hope. I want to look at one other passage today. This one is in the Old Testament. Jeremiah is describing his life as a prophet of God. Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 1 through 26. Jeremiah is often referred to as the weeping prophet. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and made me weak in darkness and not in light. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again through the day. He has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. He has set me in dark places like the dead of long ago. He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. He has been to me a bear lying in wait like a lion in ambush. He has turned aside my ways and torn me in pieces. He has made me desolate. He has bent his bow and set me up as a target for the arrow. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. I have become the ridicule of all my people, their taunting song all the day. He has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drink wormwood. He has also broken my teeth with gravel and covered me with ashes. You have moved my soul. Now he's speaking right to the Lord. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. We'll stop right there. That's a pretty rough place to be. And he describes his situation for us with a lot of colorful language that gives us opportunity to get it. At this point, as the Spirit of God is allowing Jeremiah to pen these words, he is sharing his experience. And he, at this point, is letting the reader know he is not in a happy place. He has been hit hard. He blames God for some of it. He blames his family, people around him for some of it. He is 
making it clear that instead of light, he's walking in darkness. I'm not thinking that any one in particular here or listening today would be able to say these same words, but how many of us have felt like Jeremiah? We've looked at our situation. We've seen one thing after another go, quote unquote, wrong. We have taken on a role of a victim because he sees himself as a victim of God here. And we are complainers. We're murmurers. We're grumbling. And even though we may keep a good face with people around us because we want to maintain some kind of image, we still inside feel so broken. So broken. That's who we are. I think it's clear at this moment as he's penning these words that he is leaning on his own understanding. And his own understanding is really descriptive of where he's at. But I'm glad that it doesn't end there because the Spirit of God who is inspiring him to write goes into that realm of hope where our own understanding now is diminished, Jeremiah's understanding is diminished, and God's elevated over his circumstances. In verse 21, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Do you see the flip? And you see that so many times in, in the Psalms as well. People are desperate. They're broken. They're hurting. Their life seems like it is a mess. Nothing that they've done has produced the fruit that they had hoped it would pr produce. And there they are, sinking in a pit of discouragement. And yet, as they allow themselves to look up and to see God and to remember God, and to remember what he's done. It produces hope and faith. And it takes them from their own interpretation of what's going on. And it puts them in the a realm where God is. And they know God's promises are true. That is exactly what Jeremiah is saying here. God is true to his word. Even though I'm going through the hardest of situations, I can't figure it out in my own understanding. I refuse to lean on my understanding in this place. I instead am going to lean on God, trust in him. And Lord, here's my heart. I love what he says here. He is giving God his soul, the very heart of his life. It's all yours. I'm surrendering it to you. Man, if we could live this out as a rule, what a difference our lives could be. We are always going to have those moments like I had with that one text message. But man, what a lesson. Because that one little thing had such a weight on my entire activity, mental, emotional, and spiritual activity. Oh, I just, I, I looked at Daisy and I, I said, I can't believe this. What, what did I just do in that one area? And I found myself having to go to the Lord and repent of sin and humble myself. And, and Lord, please 
remind me that even in these little things, I need to trust in you with all my heart and not be the end all answer with my own interpretation. Have you ever been there? God absolutely must reign. When we become the authority, it is not going to go well for us. We're all going to have struggles. We are all going to have times when we will say things like Jeremiah. We are going to cry. We may wonder why God didn't answer the prayer. He, he mentions that clearly. I prayed, but God shut the door. He didn't hear me. You ever thought that? And this is when we have to get off of what we're interpreting on our own, with our own finite senses and mind and trust him with all of our heart. And whatever it is that we're going through, Lord, you're here. Psalm 139 reminds us that wherever we go, wherever we are, God's there. God is already there. No matter where we go, God is over there. What a comfort that should be. And help us acknowledge then, God, I'm in this circumstance. It looks dark to me, but your light, so I'm acknowledging you in this. And I'm going to follow you. You're going to take my steps. You're going to lead me. You're going to guide me. This is the simplicity of faith. Trust, acknowledge, his promise is fulfilled. But when we get involved, we become an authority, that's not going to work. I know some of you may, may be right now going through a lot of difficulty. You're hurting. You're struggling. You're going through things that maybe other people don't even know about. But I want to assure you that God is present. And I want to do something right now that we normally would not do. But I'm going to ask that we just pause. And we need to pray. We need to pray for each other. We need to pray for the person next to us. I want to encourage you as a husband and wife, pray right now with your spouse. Pray with your family. If we lean on our own understanding right now, we might say, oh man, I, no, no, this can't be done. I can't do it. No, this is, this is out of my comfort zone. And we will diminish the opportunity for God to work. But if we say, okay, God tells us to pray for each other. God tells us to pray without ceasing. God tells us that we are to pray with all prayer and supplication for all saints. God tells us that we're supposed to lay hands on other people and pray for their healing spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally. This is what God's word tells us to do. But so often, our understanding of church is that we go... We sit down, we stand up, one person will pray, we take an offering, we sing songs, we listen, we don't sleep, and we leave. That's what we see church as. We put the Spirit of God often in a box. We just sang, Holy Spirit, man, just fill this place with your presence. Give us peace. Give us direction. Give us your instruction. Give us, give us awareness of God. So we need to pause right now. And what I'm going to ask you to do, and I'm not saying pray silently. Pray so another person can hear you. But if, you're, if you have a person next to you, you came with that person, pray with them right now. If you are alone, 
You want to sit there and pray uh, right there in, in your seat? I'm, I'm encouraging you to pray. And after a few moments, I'm going to close in prayer and we're going to go into communion. So if you have a spouse sitting by you, hold their hand. If you have a friend sitting by you, hold their hand and pray. Pray right now that God will help them. That God will have compassion over them. That God will lead them. That God will give them an opportunity to make adjustments in their life if they need to. So let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity that we have to come to you together. We are united in prayer. We are thanking you, Lord, for your power, for your presence. Lord, we are grateful that you have called us and that you will not leave us. Lord, you will not forsake us. Lord, we pray for individuals here today who are hurting physically, financially, emotionally. Lord, I pray that they would sense your overwhelming presence and power. Lord, I pray that they would have clarity, that they would have wisdom in their decision making. Lord, I pray for husbands and wives here today. I pray for families here today. Lord, we're asking that uh, unity would prevail. Lord, we're praying that uh, your spirit would continue to not just indwell uh, believers, but, Lord, enable and equip believers from this church and from other local churches around the world to go out and to advance your kingdom. Lord, help us not to lean on our own understanding. Lord, help us to realize it's important to get counsel. It's important to get advice. It's important to have understanding of issues that we are confronted with. But, Lord, you've told us not to lean on our understanding. And so, Lord, help us to live out that scripture with truth. Thank you, Lord, for your protection. Thank you for your providence. Thank you for your promises. Lord, we continue to pray for America. Lord, our country has been shaken for quite a while. And Lord, even in the past couple of weeks, the events that we have seen unfold in front of us 
uh, Lord, just give us as believers a better opportunity to trust you. You are sovereign. You are on the throne. And Lord, you have told us in your word how we are to pray for our country. And Lord, as individuals and as a local church, we need to humble ourselves before you. We need to turn from our wickedness. We need to seek your face. We need to pray. We need to trust you. And Lord, we're asking you to just continue to help us to do that. We pray for America. We pray for the upcoming election. We're asking, Lord, for your help. We're praying that your people around this great country would stand up for righteousness, would stand up for truth, and that, Lord, even in that realm, we would not lean on our own understanding, but we would trust you and look at your sovereignty and grab a hold of it. We are so thankful that we have the opportunity to say, thank you, Jesus, you are on the throne. Lord, help us as we go into this time of communion, the Lord's Supper. Lord, it's something that you've called us to do. And as we are going through this, we are to remember you. And so, Lord, even as, as Ann communicated to us, it's important to, to stay on what is important. We, we need to recognize it's the gospel message that always needs to be elevated. And Lord, we do that today. We are thankful for your blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. We're thankful for your burial and for your resurrection. And we thank you, Lord, that you are coming again. So Lord, as we go through this, help us to examine our lives, examine our heart, and to make sure we are clearly not leaning on our understanding, but we are following you with all of our heart. Thank you so much for doing this for us in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to ask Philip to be playing for us today. He's going to be playing in the background and we're going to have an opportunity to sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. We want that to be the focus of this time of communion. Turn your eyes on him. Remember what he's done for you. Examine your life. This, of course, is not the table of Southside Union Chapel, but it is the Lord's table. And it's something that he gave us to do to constantly remember that we have been bought with a price and that that great Redeemer who has forgiven us and who has cleansed us from sin is going to come back again. And that is the day we look forward to. So let's just turn our eyes on Jesus. Let our focus be on him. I'm going to ask that you stand and just ask uh, Gianna, if you would mind, I guess, Heidi, to just start us out today.
night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He gave thanks. He said, this is my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. God, we just are so thankful, Lord, for just being in your presence, Lord, and just tuning into what you have in store for us. Lord, as we conclude today, I just pray over the rest of this day, but Lord, help us continue to be in that manner of worship throughout this day and throughout the week. Help us continue to be the light of this disturbed world we live in. And Lord, I just ask that we continue to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.